welcome to Artist Spotlight. Um, we have uh, Carla Benamias in here. She's the uh, Epic Records film and TV music manager. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to start off with some. Uh, that's right, cool. Um, so let's start off with some basic questions. So where are you from? I know you're in L.A. now. Where are you from and what got you first interested in pursuing film and music and entertainment in general? Absolutely. So I'm actually originally born in Paris, but spent most of my life in the States, but have a very, very French family um, and moved to New York when I was about four and then went to L.A. for college um because i knew that i wanted to be in the music industry and i just was trying to find my place in it and yeah. that that would definitely took some time and some internships and my first real internship in the actual industry was actually at primary wave entertainment um and it was although i was supposed to be on both the sync side the music publishing side and the management side of primary wave um, I was heavily involved with their sync team. And that's actually when I fell in love with sync and the intersection between, you know, music and film and television and really anything that's a visual media. And for, for me, that, that love was found through the internship. Um, and then I decided to do more internships that were surrounding that front and it just confirmed my speculations. So that's how I started. Nice, nice. So you just kind of jump right in. Did you have any mentors? Did you have anybody to say, you know, call and check this out? You might want to think about, did you know what sync was? I mean, how did you, you know what I mean? Definitely not. Nothing. So <laughs> thank you to my wonderful college, UCLA. Uh, they would actually be really helpful in terms of resources for available internships uh, or even just connections with past, like, alumni or um even just connections that they had by virtue of being UCLA. And so they were very helpful in like putting me in touch with people. But actually everything Sync World related um, started thanks to, thanks to an alumni who just like spoke in one of our classes and I reached out to her afterwards. She's actually, she's actually now a manager of um, Sync at Universal, um, Universal not pictures, but Universal like music publishing. Yeah. Um, and she actually, told me everything. He was like, oh, this is the barbecue you need to go to. Like, this person, like, can totally talk to you more about sync. Like, I'll link you up with them. And because she did that for me, I always, you know, try to do that for our interns or for anybody that's reaching out to me that's kind of, like, young and, and hungry and yeah. wanting to get in. Yeah. Explain what, for those who don't know, um, what your role as a sync manager in film and music, what does that actually entail? What's your day-to-day -day job? So, um, this is the one sentence that I use to describe my job to anybody that doesn't understand it. <laughs> All right. what is it? Working at Epic Records in sync means that I'm representing the artists on the, ro on the Epic roster. So no one outside of Epic. Um, so they, they have to be signed in some, some capacity, whether they were signed a couple years ago or they're signed now. They have to be on the front line is what we call it. But anyway, um, so I'll represent Epic Records roster for placement in film, television, video games, and commercials. And then it's my responsibility to take it from start to finish. So I'll pitch it. I'll clear it, which means I'll negotiate whatever terms need to be negotiated for the that placement in a visual media to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then that's when my role hopefully stops and I can get a confirmation that it was used and I'll pass it off to our uh, contracts team for licensing. But on the day to day, that's what I'm doing. I'm actively trying to find creative opportunities for the music by epic artists in any visual media whatsoever. And how are you finding the opportunities to pitch to and who are these people? Are these showrunners, directors, video game developers? Who are you talking to and how are you getting that pitch? All right, so I'm gonna break it up by media. On the, okay. on the TV side, so actually across the board, we're overwhelmingly always, always talking to the music supervisors because they're the bridge between the labels, the publishers, the managers, the independent artists and the production whether that production mm -hmm. is TV or film, or it's actually an agency working on a commercial, doesn't matter. There's always like usually a middleman of some sort. 
So on the TV mm-hmm. side, we'll be talking to the, the music supervisor. Sometimes we'll be talking to the in-house like team, the in-house music team. Um, how do I say for people that don't know, like the in-house music team at ABC, for instance, we'll be talking yeah. to them yeah. just like we'll be talking to the independent music supervisors. And if we're lucky and we've built relationships with producers or showrunners, then, then we might go that route. But it's usually always out of respect for the music supervisor because, like, that, that's our point of contact. We're not supposed to go around anybody, you know, like, yeah. that's the, the, the business. <laughs> um, on the film side, it'll still be, uh, for the major, like, major films, it'll be the in-house studio executive. So whether that's, like, the team, the music team at Universal Pictures or the, the music team at Netflix. And then they'll let us know if there's any, like, music supervisor that's attached from those, like, either super indie music supervisors or the actual um, music supervision houses, like Chop Shop or Format or all of those. Mm -hmm. So those are, so film and TV is very, is very similar in that it's music soups, in-house teams, and then if we're lucky, we have relationships with at least some showrunners, directors, producers, etc., uh, it. When it comes to the video game space, we're usually always, unless the video game has hired a third party to rep them for sync purposes, we're we're always talking directly to the video game company and to that to the team. So if I'm pitching to Electronic Arts or to Harmonix or to Epic Games, I'm talking directly to them. Um, and then on the ad side, there's there's another another buffer in between, which are frequently the ad agencies that brands hire to represent them and like you know work out all those creative campaigns. So then we're talking to the agency representatives, and usually not the brand. However, there are brands that do their own their own creative and their own marketing and that they have people that are familiar with licensing, et cetera. And then in that case, we're talking directly to the brand. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you got a lot of uh, different um, channels that you're going to day to day between all of those different commercials, film, TV, games, content. So how do you determine like what in your roster to pitch to who to what? And is that constantly changing? It is. It is definitely constantly mm-hmm. changing. Now, the good news is that once you're, you know, kind of set up to work in sync somewhere and you've built some relationships in the sync community, you will get creative briefs. So it's there's always both a proactive and a reactive component. Proactive is when I'm just having to like look up what projects are upcoming, find the contact and try to like get in there and pitch music. Reactive is mm-hmm. they're going to reach out to me. Like the actual music supervisors are going to send me a note being like, "Hey, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z music for this spot, this is my budget. What do you have? Here's the deadline. So film and TV, honestly, is, a, is all across the board. Film and television, whether you are indie or established, there will, be, there will be a home for you, and it's about getting to the right people, for sure. Uh, because so many productions have different budgets, and sometimes they have, you know, a lot of money for a spot and so they're gunning for that commercial music that we're hearing on the radio or sometimes they they don't and they really need that creative fit for less money um so there is really like it's just all it's really all across the board there's not more more hip-hop or more pop or it's just like depends on the production depends on the project and there's room for, for everybody that being said there's always tracks that are more sync friendly which to me means tracks that are used over and over and over again, not just like one-offs or the right project. We found a home. It's like, no, these are, you know, sync winners. Like come with me now by Congos was all over the place um, for a while. Yeah. Um, and those, and those tracks are usually vague in narrative. So it's like, it's not, it's not storytelling. It's, it's universal themes because it has to speak and, you know, lend itself to these very, specific creative spots on the ad and video game side though the music is very different for obvious reasons um commercials it it really depends on what creative they've decided for a campaign sometimes that means like they're not using maybe any commercial music whatsoever and they're just scoring um or sometimes they're using that very like small uh independent artist that's maybe writing them a song for the spot um 
because they need acoustic folk and like tug at the heartstring things. Um, but for the most right. part, I feel like commercials will want like, if I, to, if, if I had to split it up percentage wise, I feel like in the ad space, probably 50 to 60% of projects that agencies are working on don't have a big enough budget for commercial licensing. Like, so if you're working at a major label or an indie label and your fees like demand a certain amount of money, you're missing a lot, a lot of those projects because they're, they're more like score composition and maybe like smaller licensing fees. And then for like right. 50 to 40, 40 to 50% of that, of the other time will be commercial music. And a, a good chunk of that will be catalog, like iconic, recognizable catalog tracks. And that's when it's really hard to get in there if you're an independent artist. Right. Um, and then the other will, will just be like, yes, there's room for everything and it depends on the campaign. Um, but in general, ad, the ad music, I feel like requires, you know, like kind of shifts and dynamic and, t and texture and, um, you know, m more soul and no repetitiveness because the spots are so small and you always have to move along with the spot. So if you're staying in the same place for too long, you're probably not going to be able to work with it. Can they actually create something if they're on your roster to fit the project or is it always something that's already pre-done and you just want to pitch what you already have? A majority of the time, we're going to want to pitch what we already have because there's so many details to consider when writing new music. So even though those opportunities do come and they're amazing and honestly, some of them are my favorite to work on because they take so much coordinating, you have to think about, okay, if we're agreeing to have an artist create a new work, one, is, the, is whoever is asking for this music 100% going to use the song because if they're, right. they're doing it if they're doing it on spec like is it worth their time so there's there's just a lot of back end negotiations that people don't realize will come into things like that um so it's not as as easy as you'd think it's not oh we get a brief we don't have anything oh how about we have like some of our artists just write something that we can send it's just not not that easy but it can be that easy yeah. when you're working independently. So there is a difference between like if you're at a, a major label or publisher and when you're at a like a sync agent or a sync agency or a production house, it's like all all different things. Yeah, just basically like um, does, does, does your particular job in sync or supervision of music, does it require a broad uh, knowledge of music and whatever skills do you have to kind of have coming in um, to, to, to fill in that kind of role? I think so. One is I'm definitely not a music supervisor and being a music supervisor, I think 100% you need so much like broad knowledge of music because you're going to be attached to mm -hmm. so many projects and you're going to need to draw mm -hmm. from your scope of knowledge to be able to not want to rip your head off when you get those briefs for 50s to 60s German music or whatnot. Um, from being on the label side and my role at, at a label in sync, I think that my knowledge of music in a general sense and different genres is not necessarily mandatory, but I'm sure it's helpful. But the most important thing for me to be aware of is really know my roster. So know exactly what, what we have, what the songs are about, um, what we can offer. That's the most important, I would say, along with relationships in the sync community. But I do not have a vast knowledge of catalog or well, I don't have vast knowledge of all music genre and I still can and can do this job so it's but I'm sure it would be helpful if I did because then I could get more in the brain of a music supervisor have you had to uh have a good working not at least like a good working legal knowledge built up over the years to explain that and what's your relationship with attorneys and publishers and that kind of thing yes so the legal knowledge is definitely takes a while to build up. And I would say like now three years in, I really recognize how important and how much information I've built up in that, in that amount of time. Um, I have a super close because it's necessary relationship with our in-house attorneys because they, they, right. they tell me everything, you know, they tell me what our rights to songs are. They tell me who I have to go to, to for approvals. They tell me what the, you know, if a song is released on a soundtrack, like what we can do and what we can't. Um, and then a whole other myriad of things that I, that I couldn't do my job without them. I'm probably talking to them every single day. Um, in terms of relationships with publishers, 
that's a little different because there's always the client that's a that's a buffer really between the two so even though i have to have when i'm making um like record label music i do always have to have a sense of will the publishing be able to clear like who even has the publishing do we have a list of the writers and the splits involved because i never want to be pitching something that's not clearable and that Right. That's where the relationship comes in. But I'm not contacting music publishers for every search being like, hey, like, will this work? You know, because that that would be okay. crazy. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. And then also legally, when it comes to actual like clearances and fees that we agree on for these song uses, we can't like we're not supposed to be talking to the publishers and aligning in any way, shape or form. All right, so let's switch a little bit of the topics. A lot of times people who want to come to Artist Spotlight, they want to actually find out about how to get the first job and how to enter in. So you're a manager now, correct? Yeah. Okay, so what do you look for? What's for Carla to bring somebody on as an intern or a staff team member? Um, what do you look for and what, how do you find your – and actually, what do you look for in them? And actually, how do you normally find up-and-coming talent and people who might have you know, just got out of school or looking to break in? What do you look for and how do you find them? Yeah. Um, what I look for, proactivity, <laughs> like proactiveness or proactivity, how, whatever the actual word is, if, if you're not proactive, ugh, that I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I prefer to bring on interns that I sense there's a proactive nature to them. Cause I think that's a huge part right. of my role. And it's a huge part of the role of, you know, like a coordinator below me, for instance. Um, also doing their homework like just a like a working knowledge of what it is they're actually asking or and applying for uh because so many times we we i've i've certainly interviewed a lot of interns that that came and during the interview i realized they didn't understand sync whatsoever and yet they so badly wanted to be in it and i'm like but you didn't even try to understand you know how do you know this right. is the right fit for you yeah. and frequently right. i i find myself you know after those um after those interviews being like okay well like maybe she's more of a digital person should i pass her on to our digital department but but that's because like i want to help but a lot of people are just going to be like, okay, whatever, you know, like th this is done. This person doesn't actually understand what, what we're doing. They're not the right candidate. So doing your homework and being proactive are probably like my two, my two biggest ones because those skills carry on when you hire. Okay. And then in terms it, of how I find them, this is no surprise. I'm sure to everybody who's listening, I find them through my mutual connections and my circle. And that's why relationships are, are so important because even though we will, when, you know, like I'll post on, on the Facebook groups that I'm a part of, if I'm really looking for interns, but that's still my circle, you know, like I'm posting on my socials, right. I'm asking my friends, I'm asking my counterparts and that's wave one. And then I, after that wave one or simultaneously, I'll, I'll ask our HR department to send me resumes. And then that leaves it open for all, for everybody that's applied, you know, like online, but frequently that first pass is so, so tight. And so it's very important to try yeah. to get someone that, you know, to, you know, put, put your resume at the yeah. top of the pile. It's, it's not, you know, it, it's real. It's real. I'm not going to bullshit you. <laughs> Colin, when you're doing your proactive pitches, how do you choose the actual projects that you'd like to pitch to out of all mm -hmm. the ones that you get? Absolutely. So I weigh, I weigh different things. One is who on our roster has a release upcoming? What genre is that? And what shows lend themselves to that artist? So I think from like our needs first. Um, and once that's determined, then I'll take a look at all the, all the projects that I can find, whether it's digging through the web or pulling a report or whatnot, that could be relevant. And usually I'll look, okay, what network? Do we already have a relationship there? And if we have a relationship, then that's probably going to be my first attempt because it's less removed from the process. Um, and then I also want to make sure that it would be a good look for our artists. So I'll read, you know, like what what's going on with that with that project? Like, is it being well received? Um, if it hasn't been released yet, what how how is it anticipated? 
um, like for instance, Euphoria before it came out was like really on, on everybody's radar because there was just a sense that that show was going to be big. All right. Well, last question before we let you go, Carlo, um, give me your advice for anyone looking to become into the business, uh, even as going into the sync world, um, a, a musician trying to put up their songs in, in the sync world, um, just in general, uh, inter- being an intern following your footsteps or in general, what do you think would kind of a, over your course of your career, uh, would you give them as advice? Yeah. Um, one big thing I would say, and this is something I wish I told myself repeatedly, is uh, don't be afraid to take risks and be bold, but know your audience. You know, like really, really take risks, be bold, but know who you're talking to and know who you're being bold with and, you know, right. how, what you're doing to, to break through those doors or that community. Um, and then beyond that, internships, incredibly valuable. I- I'm sure it's pounded in by universities and friends and stuff, but it's it's real. Like internships can really get you in the door and get you your first job or just get you those relationships that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, beyond that, there are so many events um, so, and, and even panels like, like, like exactly like this one that are incredibly helpful. And if you are proactive, <laughs> exactly like, I, like, you know, that quality I love in people, proactiveness, um, then someone watching this that doesn't know me should, should 100% feel free to like slide into my DMs. And if they have any questions about not, you know, not even sync, but just the industry, um, I'm happy to help in that way. And that's what they, that's what people shouldn't be afraid to do. And not not being afraid. Like, there's always a way to politely approach somebody. Like, go for it. I, I think I'm going to echo you. I think what you're saying is there's a time and a place for everything, you know? Yep, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, Carl, listen, uh, please stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll definitely be, hope you become a friend to the show. Come back and speak at another time with us, at a, maybe on a Zoom or something like that. We'd love to have you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So grateful for the opportunity.